Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Okay, so several years ago, I'm crossing out of the woods into a field with my little boy. Midday, glorious. Not too far from Yosemite, I walk in little boy-sized steps toward where I hear my friends rattling cookware together at the campsite. They're finishing off lunch preparations. Between us and them runs a stream. And while we're crossing it, we see a box turtle just hanging out next to the water. My boy, he says to me, Turtle! Turtle. I agree. (laughs) Turtle. He squats down to get him a closer look, and the turtle's actually not doing much, just sitting there in the Mm -hmm. sunshine. And he watches the turtle do nothing for a while. Till I say, okay, let's go. But the boy doesn't move. Doesn't get up. He just says, Turtle! Turtle! Staring at intently. That's a turtle, all right, boy. It's going to stay a turtle. But let's get to moving on. And I start to get a little bit annoyed when he doesn't step away before that thing inside asks me a question. Where are you going? Where you got to be right now? What is more important than that turtle? And I have to laugh because we don't need to run to lunch. The food's not going anywhere. I don't even have cell service. No one's going to be upset if we take a little time. So we take a little time, this boy and I. Enough time to get a real good look at this turtle. No menagerie, no lions, no bears, just the turtle, the stream, and the sunshine. We look. We look. When the boy decides that this turtle has been properly looked after, he stands up, runs top speed toward a log, crawling with ants. And we look at those for a while, too. Look, ants! Ants. And he's right. They're amazing, truly. Some feeling out their next steps, others rushing behind the ones in front, others still not moving at all. And there is no place else I am supposed to be. Nowhere that I have to go. And when we look back today, at Snap Storytelling 10 years on, we hope that there's no place you have to be either. Call this an old school remix tape, something viral. Something blue, something old, and something new. The Snap Judgment. Look that special. My name is Lynn Washington. Always look at the turtle and the ants when you're listening to Snap Judgment. We begin back in the day. One of the first times Snap Storytelling took the stage, the live stage. Now, this piece, it does use a word that you should never, ever, never, 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 ever use. So don't use it. Ever. But we did, of course, save you the very best seat in the house. Snap Judgment. Live. Please put your hands together for Mr. Ice Life.
I remember when I didn't know I was black. I didn't know better. I mean, I had no sense of one group of people being better than or greater than another. At best, I knew that certain people belonged in certain places. For example, the orange people that spoke something my mama called Spanish, they lived in the Fruitvale. And they sold fruit in bags. The people who were the same color as my grandma, they were on TV, you know, like the news. And also, there were cartoons. Elmer Fudd, Yosemite Sam, Daffy Duck was a duck. <laughs> but somehow I knew he was the same color as my grandma too. <laughs> the kids I went to school with with sleepy eyes, they were from far away. And they always had rice in their lunch bags. Peanut butter jelly sandwiches and Capri Suns went in mine. My grandma was born Billy Matzka in 1933 to a family of poor Irish farm workers. Yes, me. Revolutionary black power rapper man, me. My first best friend was an old white lady, my grandma. And I loved her very much. I guess because she grew up poor on a farm, she knew how to make fun out of absolutely nothing. Well, I'd say nothing. Grandma say nothing. <laughs> For example, she'd take the, the, the peaches that came in cans and she'd dump them in the sink, you know? And then she'd put the cans on the ground and she'd tap holes in the cans. And then she'd run string through the cans up to the height of my hands. And in her groggy voice, she'd go, stand on the cans, Isaac. And I'd get on the cans and she'd put the string in my hands like reins. They were stilts. Ha! <laughs> I'd walk around the yard six inches taller than I really was. Clank, 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 clank. I felt like a giant. The kids I went to school with, they made a big deal out of me having a white grandma. Most of us never got to see white people up close unless it was the police. So, me having a white grandma meant I got to see Bigfoot up close. <laughs> She'd pull up to the school to pick me up. They'd go, that's your grandma? And I'd go, yep, and I'd run off to the car. <laughs> grandma had this long, old, gold Ford. It didn't have a tape deck. It didn't even have an FM radio. But grandma didn't care. AM radio provided the soundtrack for old white lady daily life. <laughs> The songs always had this real kind of, you know. <laughs> slow, boring, and redundant. Easy to dance to. Reminiscent of Jim Crow, but sounds like music to you. But I didn't know they were old white lady songs. I just knew there were songs that my grandma liked. I'd be right next to her singing along. <laughs> As I got older, I stopped getting picked up by grandma and I started catching the bus to her house by myself. I graduated from my peach can stilts to bouts of Scrabble with my grandmother. Me and my grandma, we played Scrabble. It's when I first fell in love with the concept of tying words together, you know? Not only did I graduate from my peach can stilts, I also graduated from my naive view on race. By the time I was 12 years old, I was quite clear that in this country, white meant better. Not only did I graduate from my naive view on race, so did my homies at school. They went from thinking it was cool that I had a white grandma to teasing me for it. That didn't bother me. What did bother me though was commentary from two homies in my hood, Kevin and Brandon. Brandon joined the Nation of Islam, and he was 19 when I was 12, so we all thought he was like a super grown-up, you know? He'd stand booming from the corner like it was a podium. All white people are devils. They're all racist. They enslaved black people. They enslaved the whole world. 
It would drive me crazy. I'd argue with him, going on and on about how that wasn't true. My grandmother was proof. She was a white woman married to a black man and had black children. How could she be racist? Here came Cool Kev. Blood. Just because she be around black people don't mean she ain't racist. Black people don't like black people. So you know white folks don't. I felt defeated on the issue, but not about my grandma. I knew she wasn't racist, and she loved me very much. The summer that I was 14 years old, I went and spent the summer with my brother in Fresno, and my sisters, they flew down to San Diego to spend time with our uncle. When I got back home, I landed at the airport. My mama said, Ice, where you want to go? What did I say? Grandma's house. Off we went. We got there, and right away, Grandma started setting up the Scrabble board. She started asking me all the questions that Grandma's asked, you know. How was your trip? How's your brother? Did you eat? Like, I'm not going to eat. <laughs> Did you talk to your sisters while you were gone? No, but Connie wrote me a letter. She said they're getting dark tans down there from all the sun. And, and then my world changed forever. My grandmother reached across the table and touched my hand. She said, oh, no, they're going to come back looking like little niggers. I fell down inside. Then I died a little. I can't tell you what happened next. I don't know if it was nighttime or daytime when we left. I regained consciousness in my bed. Weeping, mourning, the way it feels to mourn something you hold tight against the fabric of your being, the thing I was holding on to with all of my young might, the part of me that didn't want to live in a world where anyone, and surely not my grandmother, saw me as a nigger, useless, a dumb <laughs> For the years that grew into my teenage years, I imagine I saw my grandmother no more than a dozen times. We never talked about it. And I just used it as another layer on the callus to weather day-to-day -day life in the hood. Recently, though, I started writing my grandmother a letter. I wrote about what I felt like she took away from me that day in the kitchen. How it made me feel. From a space of growth, I also wrote about my travels and everywhere I've been because I knew she'd enjoy that. And for a moment, I felt a certain nostalgia and it was good to feel her close to me again. My grandmother died before I could deliver my letter. And with her death, also went the opportunity for us to confront this issue and maybe put it behind us. Love conquers hate. But where was the love? Thank you. It's life, doing it back in the day. Snap Judgment Live, original music by Alex Mandel. The live score performed by Alex and the Snap Judgment players, Tim Frick and David Brandt. Now, on Snap Judgment, the look back special continues. Never go in the woods alone. Stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread, that's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds, Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic, Dave's Killer Bread. 
Bread Amplified. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a mental health professional in your pocket. Talkspace offers both therapy and psychiatry, and being able to reach out to a provider anytime, anywhere, makes addressing mental health super easy, and getting started is the most important part. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code JUDGMENT to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's JUDGMENT and Talkspace.com. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Look Back Special. Now today on Snap, I'm going to meet a young man by the name of Brody Young. And Brody Young is one of those jobs for which only the truly tough should apply. He's a state park ranger at a place called Dead Horse Point, deep in the canyon lands of southern Utah. The thing is, when you're a ranger in those parts, it also means that you're the law enforcement. Now Brody, he takes his job seriously. But his real love, his first love, is the desert, the canyons, the rivers, the place. Snap judgment. So let's talk about the stars that come out at night. You can see all the stars. It's just so clear and so dark. It's considered dark sky country. And when the sun rises and you go, uh, you know, on the cliff's edge, up at Dead Horse Point, you can see mountain ranges that are 100 at 150 miles away. It's just desolate and vast, and if you don't go out prepared, um, it's going to bite you. I've recovered a lot of bodies, um, whether they were on the river, you know, or got lost in those canyons, and they just weren't prepared. So. You're, you're, you're putting yourselves on a, on a, on a tightrope and it's easy to fall. In Desolation Canyon on the Green River, there's a few places you can go see uh, a skull, <laughs> which is odd, isn't it? But someone dies in the desert, they're gonna stay there for a long time before they're found. And some people uh, choose to go die alone in a beautiful place that happens actually kind of frequently. And that's that's something I have a hard time understanding. How can life get so bad that you want to end it? November 19th, 2010, I was on patrol. I was on a uh, an extra shift. I'd worked that day, but there was some overtime money available. And it's a really warm, warm night. It's kind of the warm before the storm. Then I went down uh, this Colorado River corridor to these trailheads to see if anyone is still up onto the trails. And uh, the first trailhead I went to was Poison Spider Mesa Trailhead. So I found this lone car in the kind of back of the parking lot, and it was parked really awkward like. I was worried someone would be out on the trail still that hadn't made it back. It was kind of late, and uh, late in the season too. So I couldn't see a plate, and I kind of rolled up to it and turned on my overhead white lights and um, got out of my truck and walked around to the driver's side, and I see this lump in the back seat. And I think, oh, man, someone's sleeping in there. And so I knock on the window, and, you know, I knock on it several times. And this gentleman wakes up, and... He opens the door and I tell him who I am and and ask if he's okay. And then he said he was and then we talked about where he could go camp because camping wasn't allowed in that parking lot. And he was in a sleeping bag. So I didn't get a good look at his face. His face today still doesn't mean much, but I needed to get some ID on him. And he doesn't have any or doesn't want to give me ID, so I asked him to wait there, and I walked back to my truck. And I looked back once, which is what you're supposed to do when you're on a traffic stop. 
but my night vision was blinded from the lights. And I couldn't hear anything but the noise of the truck. But just as I got to my truck door and just as I was about to get in, that's when the first shot rang out. It hit, hits me in my left arm. I'm left-handed. It shatters, and, man, I screamed out. And I turn, and I just see muzzle flash. And him advancing on me, firing one shot after the other. Three more rounds hit my back. Two of those rounds were stopped by the vest, but the third round broke through and went into my vertebrae. I fell to the ground at that point, and he is just standing right over me, hitting me with round after round. There was a lot of gravel bouncing around. Eventually, he stops. And then um, I had this moment. It's a terrible cliche, but it was either you lay down and die or you get up. And man, I wanted to live. So I got up. It startled him and he ran to the front of my truck and I ran to the back of mine. And in the meantime, I'm looking at my left hand and I'm telling it to grab the gun, but it won't grab the gun, it won't move. And I finally just said to myself, you idiot, use your other hand. And that's when I began firing back at him through the windows of my truck. I was also counting uh, my rounds because I knew my reload was going to be with my arm dangling. Ah, uh, non-traditional. So I released the mag and put the gun between my legs. And I used my bumper to to chamber around, and I begin shooting more. I fired um, in all about 24 rounds, and then he raises his hands and I stop shooting. And he says, you got me. And then I began to go unconscious. I woke up a short time later. Um, I was laying on my back and I kind of raised my head and looked down my body to see my truck running and um, I noticed his car was gone. And then I thought to myself laying there, no one knows I'm here. I didn't notify anyone that, that I was out checking on this car. I had been been shot nine times and I knew that the only way I was going to get help as if I got to that truck radio. But I did not feel right inside. Um, I felt very heavy, like someone had poured concrete on me. Uh, my right leg was numb. My left arm was numb. And it was really hard to move. And I slowly began just rolling onto my stomach, rolling onto my back, towards my truck. And this took some time, it felt like forever. And, you know, the exhaust is, is on and it's pouring out. But eventually I reached the front door. And the front door was open. Joe, I've always made it a point to get out of my truck, leaving that door open. I've just always felt like I should. And I leaned up against it, reached for the radio and said, Price, 2 Alpha 6 9. I'm a poison spider mace at Trailhead. I've been shot. Please hurry. And uh, I didn't know what to do after that. All my training, I just didn't know what to do after that. When the ambulance arrived, it took me to the hospital in Moab. And from there, I was chopper to the hospital in Grand Junction where I underwent emergency surgery. But let me just tell you the damage. Uh, my heart was hit, small intestine, colon, right kidney, liver, diaphragm, left lung, spine, pelvis, left humerus, 
you know, left triceps muscle, right forearm, right femoral nerves, right hip flexor. And they told me that I shouldn't be alive. Say I died a couple of times during those first few days in surgery. But after I woke up, I eventually got to the point where I asked, where, where's the suspect? So I was told that after I was taken to the hospital, they found uh, the car that he had driven off in, and it was definitely off the beaten path. But they noticed that there was a blood trail that wandered off down the river corridor. And they followed this blood trail uh, for like a mile to uh, a boulder field, and it looked like it had been setting up to ambush anyone who came over the hill because there was a backpack and a 22 rifle and, you know, food and sleeping gear. And uh, he didn't leave a blood trail from that point on, and so the trail went cold. But when they found his vehicle, they ran the license plate and found that it led them to a name of Lance Leroy Ariano. Was there anything in his backpack in the car that his family could tell you anything that would explain why he shot you multiple times in the middle of the night on a routine traffic stop? No, no explanation. Did he have any kind of criminal record? Yeah, it was very minor, nothing violent. So why would someone do this? What would lead them down this path to where shoot a cop and run out in the desert and disappear. Not sure why, but federal and state and local agencies began to search for Lance over an area the size of Los Angeles. There was a river search, sonar capability, a helicopter. Uh, then there were just a lot of tracking teams, you know, gun in hand and flashlight in the other, crawling through tamarisk bushes that were tall as cottonwood trees. Um, there were a lot of calls. Yeah, we've seen him. I mean, everyone wanted him found, right? And uh, wanted a reward, and a lot of those, well, all of them turned out to be bogus, but um, they checked on all of them. They even went down San Diego and searched to see if he was being very well hidden amongst this motorcycle club. I even thought I saw him uh, a couple of times in town. You know, dark curly hair, and he was wearing a hat. Like at the grocery store, I would, you know, go back to that aisle just to walk past and to make sure. I don't know if he would recognize me. I didn't really get a good look at him if I would recognize him. But I had a couple of dreams, and both dreams were the same. We were at a party, and then I would see Lance come, you know, out of the corner of the room towards me. He would raise his hand, and he would shoot at me, and then I would shoot back, and he would die. And so one year after another would pass, and that was kind of torturous, not knowing what happened after, you know, he left me for dead and he drove off. Where did he go? I wanted an ending to it. And then Christmas Eve 2015... We're making uh, little vials of vanilla to give out to our friends. And we, I get a knock at the door, and it's my lieutenant. He says, come outside real quick, and his face is, is not right. So I go out and close the door in my front yard and snow on the ground, and he says, we found him. Two brothers had found the body in a cave half buried in mud. And I just I broke down. It was just, I just couldn't believe it because I thought uh, he would never be found. And uh, I'll tell you, it's only 400 yards from where the backpack was. He went 400 yards and uh, crawled into this crack of a cave. 
So I got to see the evidence at the, at the sheriff's office. <clears throat> and uh, boy, saw the, saw the bones and it was still in the sleeping bag, but they had it opened and then um, it was kind of laid out, head, ribs, you know, arms. And it's really hard to determine how he passed away, but I imagine he was, he was probably scared. Because when you're hurt and you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's dark and it's getting colder and it's starting to snow, you can't warm up, you're cold, your breathing is, is getting worse. Um, that's got to be the worst feeling in the world. And it's probably why he crawled into that cave, was just to rest. And there was a letter amongst his stuff, and it was from his daughter. His daughter talked about, we're finally going to be able to spend this Thanksgiving together. And uh, she was really looking forward to it. But he didn't live beyond that night. He just laid down in that cave and didn't get back up. I didn't know him. I didn't even really get a good look at his face. But several times I'm told um, that I just, I, I shouldn't be alive. So I don't know what death feels like, but I guess I know what it feels to get close to it. And uh, lying, lying on the ground before anyone showed up, I felt like I had help by me that night. It was really hard to, it's hard to describe, Joe. But um, all I can say is that uh, there was such a comfort, I don't know, arms wrapped around me that uh, the other side, maybe it's not going to be so bad. I don't know. What do, you, what do you think Lance felt? Do you think he experienced what you experienced? That's a hard question. Um, I, I hope so. I don't know. Maybe some maybe someday I'll get to ask the question, but it won't be in this life. Many thanks to Ranger Brody Young for sharing his story at the Snap. After a long recovery, he's back to doing what he loves, working as a state park ranger in the deserts of southern Utah. But he's also taking the motivational speaking, helping other people figure out how to survive the unsurvivable. To learn more, we'll have links to his website on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score for that story is by Leon Morimoto. It was produced by Joe Rosenberg. Now, in just a moment, nerds in the forest? What could possibly go wrong? Snap Judgment, the Look Back Special. Stay tuned. Okay, so fourth grade. Teacher saying something the eternity seconds click away once every eon. So hot. So bored. Carl leans over to me. Whispers, hey, hey, this Saturday, I dare you to pee on the electric fence. I dare you too. I say right back. And I know, right then, without a shadow of a doubt, that both Carl and I will in fact pee on the electric fence running between our respective farms outside of Kingston, Michigan. This will happen. Carl never, ever backs down, never. And Carl will never, ever see me back down either. We're farm boys. We do what we say and say what we mean. But I don't want to pee on the electric fence. It's just another one of Carl's stupid ideas. I can already hear my dad at the hospital. He did what? But there's no help for it. I gotta do it, I gotta. So I start thinking, what do I know 
about electric fences. What? And it turns out, big country that I am, I know quite a bit. See, here's the thing about electric fences you urbanites might not understand. Electric fences are only on sometimes. Farmers want to pop it enough so that the cattle are scared to touch them. But you don't want to waste all your money pouring electricity into a fence after they get the message, see? So you turn it on every once in a while. And you can turn the fence up low or up high for the bad ombre cows that aren't making America great again. But we digress. I start thinking, I'm going to pee on the fence when it ain't on. But how to tell? I can't just ask Farmer Ted. It's his fence. Word would get back. So that afternoon I go home and I sit in front of the fence. If you stare long enough, it's like you can tell. There's a hum in the air, a crackle. You could almost see the magnetic energy field ready, waiting. And then it stops. The pop goes out of the air. For hours I watch until I know the rhythm of the fence, the dance of the fence master. Saturday comes. I'm going first. You go later. I tell Carl. He looks relieved. He won't be. I make a big show about how scared I am. I bend over and smell the angry wire. You gotta be crazy to pee on that. But there's nothing. No pitch. No hum. No magnetic field. It's gonna sting, Carl. I look back with fear in my eyes. Here I go, Carl. I pull trowel and let fly. And it's not just my willy that is electrocuted. A spasm of voltage sizzles my spine, the back of my brain, my liver, my kidneys. The shockage sends me 10 feet in the air, crashing down on my back, trembling, groaning foam, leaking from my eyes, my mouth, my nose. Oh, oh man, you're something special. I ain't never seen nothing like that. Man, fry, that's what you got. I can't believe you did it, can't believe it. I even asked Ted to turn it to 10. I said there's nothing this kid won't do, and I was right, I'll tell you what. <laughs> My brain hurt. Whatever bet this is, you win. Paul, kill me if I did something crazy like that. <laughs> Look over at the fence, and the fence grins right back at me. I don't know what happened. I still don't know what happened. Either I read it wrong or it turned on right when I did my business. I don't know. But you can imagine my surprise. A few weeks ago, I turned on the TV to see two science guys announce that it's impossible to get zapped from peeing on a fence. I can prove otherwise. I can But Carl, if you're listening right now, I think it's safe to say it's your turn. Now then, get ready to unsheave your broadsword. We join a notorious anarchist organization in the midst of chaos. Snap Judgment. So we were at the edge of a gigantic national park in Pennsylvania. It's such a rustic place. We had kind of planned on just making like a big explosion of uh, violence and then leaving town. Malaclips was part of this violent anarchist group. The group didn't have a name or a purpose. They just wanted to cause chaos. They went from place to place, usually in rural areas where they could easily rob people and escape into the forest. In the middle of one particular heist, they spotted an old wooden tavern at the edge of the woods where they could hide and regroup. When we came into the tavern, there were two or three people in there. And it just so happened they're people that had looked at us funny earlier. 
we kind of had a feeling that there were people after us. And we realized that in the tavern right now is our group and these two people that don't like us, and that's it. Malaclips and his group were on the run and carrying stolen goods. They were on high alert. And when other people inside shot them suspicious looks, everything went off the rails. Fast. My friend Don, he just like looks at me and he's like, okay, now. And he just instantly starts throwing poison gases at people. Half of our group looked at him with shock and the other half jumped in on it and immediately started attacking the other people in the tavern. When we left the tavern, two people had been robbed and one was dead. So we've got to um, kind of like kill our way out of town now before anybody realizes what's happening. It's getting dark. It's five o'clock in the evening at this point. It's snowing and we're trying to keep our visibility really low. We made it to the edge of town and we started hiking into the woods. And like most of our group is in this cluster and we've got a, one person that's like 50 feet ahead of us and one person that's like 50 feet behind us. And they're like our front and rear guard. And maybe like 40 minutes after we're into the woods, the guy behind us claps twice. They were chasing us. So Don gets this idea to leave like a false trail. He has us all like follow each other's footprints, step in each other's footprints as we go off in one direction. Meanwhile, he leaves footprints in a big circle. And then he cuts off a branch of a pine tree and, and walks backwards covering his steps as he goes. We're like an hour and a half into this chase. And I'm like, they haven't found us yet. They're not gonna find us. At that moment, we see this guy emerge from the fog ahead of us. And he goes, there they are. We just, we scattered. And I ran like a couple hundred feet. And I look over my shoulder and somebody has just hit my friend Sylvia in the back and she falls down. And then all of a sudden there's like six people around her. So I, I sprint, I sprint and I panic. If these guys find me, they're gonna kill me. There's two of them, at least two of them. And there's only one of me, I don't stand a chance. So Malaclips has this idea. If he can't run, maybe he can hide. I laid down on these rocks right next to the river and I brushed a bunch of snow onto my back and I let the snow fall on me. And I can hear their footsteps. And if I look to the side, I can see feet, but not much more. They had just been running and they were kind of out of breath. I could hear talking about, like, he was just here, where is he? I just sit still in the snow. They eventually give up and go away. I look at my watch and I realize two hours has passed. I can leave the game now. He put on a small white headband and instantly Malaclips, the notorious anarchist and thief, changed back into being Dan Comstock, a lanky college sophomore with shoulder length blonde hair and a big foam sword. Dan was a LARPer, a live action role player. He'd go on long weekend retreats where everyone played along in these big fantasy come to life games. He'd been so committed to it that he found himself alone in the snow in the middle of the night. And the gravity of the situation slowly sinks in. And now I'm just a 19 year old kid lost in the mountains in Pennsylvania. I realize I'm, I'm like really lost. It's now past sunset and the snow has been falling. So I've only got like a hundred feet of footprints and then it's gone. I, I shout, help. I ran and I ran and I ran. I just like running and screaming. I just picked a direction and kept going. I start to lose hope. I'm gonna use like my last bit of energy to like climb up this big hill and see if I could see anything from there. I push my way through these like thorn bushes and I make it up to the top of this hill and it's like a big flat field. And on the far side of the field, I see a tiny farmhouse. I'm like, oh, civilization. I'm saved, I'm out of the woods. And so I, I walk over to this farmhouse. I was very conscious of that I'm dressed in this ridiculous fantasy outfit. I take off as much of my costume as I can without like shivering. <laughs> I put my foam sword around the corner and I take off my cloak. And then I took a big breath and I knocked on the door. 
it was it was a Dutch door, and the top half of it opened. And I saw a woman in a very traditional looking blue dress and bonnet, and she was holding a candle. That took me a little while to process what I was looking at. And the first thought in my head is like, what, did I wander into another LARP? And then it hits me that I'm in Amish country. I was nervous. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm lost. I'm staying at this campsite near here. And uh, could you just like point me back to where I need to go? She's like, oh my God, you were lost in the woods. That's terrible. She knew I was scared. Uh, let me wake up my, my two of my sons and they'll, uh, they'll give you a ride back. So Stephen and Levi, get two strapping Amish lads about my age, uh, get out of bed. They get on their clothes. They go out to the barn. They wake up the horse. They attach the buggy. They bring it out and I get in the buggy with them and they, we start to go back. It's like a little wooden cab with, uh, with four wheels. They have rubber tires on them. And we were sitting side by side in the front of this buggy, all three of us. They were wearing brimmed hats and I'm wearing a black cloak with a hood and leather armor with studs on it. The horse had just been woken up, so he was a little cranky. I, I think they could tell that I had never been in a horse and buggy before and they thought that was adorable. They're like, they were really polite and they didn't really let on that they were teasing me, but it was very, it was a little pointy. They're like, I've never been lost in the woods before. Were you scared? And it was just, it was really surreal, you know? Cause I'm, I'm trying to talk to these Amish people. They're like, what were you doing in the woods? And I, like, I couldn't really explain it, you know? I was like, have you ever heard of a, a Renaissance fair? No. Have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons? No. And I'm like trying not to say like, well, we pretend like we don't have technology. Like we live in a different time. It's, it's funny, you know, people talk about Amish people like they're, you know, these, these bumpkins. And I, they talk about us the same way. You know, they're good at things that we're clueless about. Like, who am I to judge? You know, I just wandered through the woods with like a cape and like a foam sword. I wasn't really able to explain it to them. And so they just kind of stop asking follow-up questions at a certain point. So we pulled up to the campsite into like a little fantasy village and there are different groups of people. There are these dark elves, they have pointy ears and they have dark makeup. Wizards who are wearing robes or, you know, and funny hats. Rangers, who, you know, kind of dress like Robin Hood a lot of the time with the kind of like pointed cap. As soon as I stepped in, my friend Don and my friend Alan, who was carrying the treasure chest, they were like, there he is. And everybody kind of cheered. Everybody was relieved. Everybody was worried about where I had been. They said, where were you? And I said, Amish country. I thanked Stephen and Levi very warmly. I gave them hugs. They seemed a little bit amused. They were looking around and weren't really sure what they were looking at, but they, they were happy I got to where I needed to go. I kind of got that sense too, like that the next day they were gonna be telling everybody, we met the weirdest guy last night. My name is Malaclips. I'm a madman, a revolutionary in the world of Tira, on the continent of Avalon, in the kingdom of Evendar, in the duchy of Greyhorn. This is a this is a land of order and chaos. There are liches and death knights, vampires, uh, werewolves. One of the werewolves is a baron, and he rules part of Greyhorn. Thank you, Dan Comstock, for the fantastical tale. Now, Dan's been organizing LARPing events for decades now. Even though Malclips the Anarchist is retired, Dan only plays the hero now. Don't get lost chasing anybody, Dan. The original score was by Renzo Gorio, and that piece was produced by Jasmine Aguilera. Oh, my. Pop the champagne, a new year, a new decade. We are thrilled you decided to spend some of it with Snap. And do we have some tremendous stories waiting for you in the new year, Snappers? Don't miss a one. But if you do miss one, the amazing, stupendous storytelling podcast awaits. Get the Snap Judgment Podcast. Share the Snap Judgment Podcast. Please comment or the trolls win. Don't let that happen. Snap is brought to you by the team that always dresses up for the party. 
throw some confetti at Mr. Top Hat himself, Mark Risky, the Uber producer, Anna, Jello Shot Sussman, Pat Tequila, Masidi Miller, Hot Coffee, Renzo Gori, Nancy Hot Butter Lopez, Leon Morimoto on the Flying Trapeze, Shayna Moonwalk Sheely, John Facile jumps out of the cake, Rissa Dodge likes the cake, Liz Cha Cha Mac, Nika, Jello Shot Sang, I thought someone else liked Jello Shots, Nika, Liza, Sparkly Wing Smith, Lauren Party Boat Newsom, Mixtaper, Tail Dakawa, Flo Wally, she plays Scrabble. And no time in the previous decade has this show ever been the news. And I'm happy to report that it is still not the news. But in fact, for months, you could plan the big Snap Judgment holiday party for next Thursday, only to discover that you reserved the venue for next Friday. And you would still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is WNYC. Yeah.